Hello, everybody. Hello. All right. On my second talk of the day, it's going to be a little bit more esoteric. This one is based on a paper I need to go ahead and put up on my website, which I haven't yet, called uh, Out of Character, Use a Punny Code and Homoglyph Attacks to Obfuscate URLs for Phishing. Unfortunately, when I started doing this research, this part of a class I was doing, I figured I'd find more vulnerabilities, and it looks like they fixed most of them already. I mean, it was a problem back in the early 2000s, and then they fixed a lot of stuff, but still, I don't know, historically it might be interesting, and I'm going to show you some other in interesting things you can do with Unicode to mess around with people. First of all, well, since you already saw the previous talk, you know who I am, you know what I run, you know what I'm interested in, uh, you know what I say about myself, uh, I know where I go for podcasting, and uh, I'm also a senior information security engineer at a Fortune 1000 company, and I'm one of the co-founders of DerbyCon. Tri-founder. Tri-founders? Co-founder? Tri-founders. Co-founders is still proper, you know, it's making the it cool, right? Well, tri Yes. Like the Three Musketeers. Hold up a second. The co-musketeers. Love this. Hello, this is Adrian. Hello. See, I answer the phone during talks because sometimes I get really funny results. Like if those people who keep trying to call me saying I have uh, my machine is infected from Microsoft, they have the Indian accent, and I can play them out and play them, and then eventually I tell them I'm running a Linux box, and they tell me to drop out to a command prompt and type like, well, IP config. They're fun to play with. Anyway, classic phishing obfuscations uh, would be things along the lines of, well, let's say you had a phishing email and you got one that said Adrian's House of Ponies. You're probably not going to click on that link because you know it doesn't sound legitimate email from like PayPal. So there's various ways you can obfuscate things. For instance, you might link to one text, but have the text inside the URL be something different. Like this is Microsoft.com, but it's actually linking to iGeek.com. In the past, didn't web browsers, you could also do all sorts of obfuscations like, well, parts of the URL are actually used for um, authentication, saying what user you are. Well, instead of, you know, iGeek.com, not as the email address, but as a login, and I think the exact specification is username, colon, password, at some place, so you can actually pass the username and password in the URL. Well, let's say someone put Microsoft.com like this. That used to be able to work in various web browsers where it looked like it's from Microsoft.com, but it's actually not. Now, anymore, Firefox pops up a warning and IE just says it's not going to connect. Uh, way back in the day, I think this is the late 90s, I was making a, like an April Fool's Day joke, uh, a hoax to say that, uh, say that uh, Apple was switching over to using AD of AMD products for the CPU. Little did I know, many years later, they actually did switch to x86. But I've used that kind of uh, obfuscation before. Now, a lot of things I've known about, though. There's one that I found kind of interesting, and that's homograph attacks. Homograph attacks is basically, well, homograph is essentially, this is not technical from a linguistic standpoint, technically accurate from a linguistic standpoint, but homograph is a word that looks the same as another word, and homoglyph is a symbol that looks the same as another symbol. For instance, these two strings look very similar. One is an RN, or soft, the other ones are Microsoft. However, if you just quickly look at them and they're small and depending on what font, they may look similar. Depending on the font also used, a 1 and an L may look the same, or a 1 and an I in some cases, I suppose. PayPal or a 0 and an O may look the same. These are different strings, but they look very similar. And that would be an example of a homograph. Now, this is all using standard ASCII characters. You can get some really good homographs if you start using homoglyphs from Unicode. Let's talk a little bit about Unicode. Uh, you, ASCII technically is only the first of 127 characters, uh, if you think. There's also extended ASCII, so you go up to your 256. But uh, Unicode in itself is only the first, I'm uh, sorry, ASCII in itself is only the first 127. Well, in that many characters, there's all sorts of word languages that use different glyphs to represent things. So you, you need more options. In steps Unicode. In Unicode, various language symbols are represented. There's like over a million code points, not all of them even taken up yet. Most of the time you represent them in hexadecimal. There's also different ways of uh, representing these characters as far as the binary that's actually going into the file. Like this UTF-8 is one of the more common ones, and UTF-16. UTF-8 is real common because if you're just representing ASCII characters, well, the file's going to look the same, uh, whether it's UTF-8 encoded or just straight up ASCII, because those bytes are going to be the same. Also, you're going to see some uh, weirdness as far as character encodings because um, 
you may have to have a character encoding specified if you're looking like the headers of your um, of uh, your communications with an HTTP server. Uh, there's various character sets like Windows 1252, which is very similar to ISO 859, but not exactly. Have you ever seen those problems where you might create a web page, you're doing most of your editing work in like Word, but instead you just copy and paste it to a web page and all your question marks, or sorry, not, all your um, quotation marks become question marks? That's because of a mismatch of character sets and um, a problems with the automatic curling quotes. Uh, the smart quotes regularly screw that kind of thing up because those particular symbols that are smart quotes in the Windows character set are not necessarily the same as in that ISO character set that I have mentioned up there. But another thing that comes into this is that in Unicode, there's a lot of similar look-alike characters. For instance, Cyrillic. A lot of Cyrillic characters look the same as our normal Latin alphabet. I mean, almost exactly the same. So you can construct homographs out of those homoglyphs. Uh, a few problems. Uh, in DNS, DNS is designed to take ASCII characters. Generally, DNS labels, you know, there's something before a dot, something, dot, something. Anything that's not a dot is a label. Uh, normally, they follow the uh, LDH rule. Basically, you're allowed to have letters, digits, and hyphens, which are not allowed to use weird uh, characters from higher in Unicode. Let's say, like, a certain Chinese character or whatnot. So this causes problems. So let's say someone wants to have a, a name for their website to be some Chinese character or some set of them, dot com. Well, how are they going to do that since that's not allowed in DNS? And that's where punny code and IDNA comes in. Now, IDNA is internationalized domain name for applications. Essentially, you take something like this, the cafe with the accented E, and it actually translates into this, which is what you actually put in your DNS system. I cannot explain to you the mathematics in the convoluted way they, they translate one to the other, but somehow or another it works. Uh, but in that way, the web browser can show the cafe with the E, but you can register this to have the same effect whenever you register your domain name. You can also have something that's a completely a different language, like this particular uh, website actually translates to this version in punny code. Now, this is the punny code. When I say punny code, I mean this ASCII representation with all the strange looking series of characters. Um, so you can set things up to do like that, and I think this is some Chinese university I found as an example of a, a, a name that's using Unicode characters. Now, back to the homoglyphs. Let's say we want to create a look-alike domain name. Like we want to be Google, but not be Google. Well, there's all the characters out there in Unicode that have a different byte value, but look exactly the same. For instance, does that look like Google to you? It looks like Google. That E looks like a perfect E. But that E is actually a Cyrillic, Cyrillic small letter E at this particular Unicode code point. It's not the same thing. And this is the actual punny code I would register for it. IUCU.org, and I'm not picking on the IU Credit Union. This happens to be the bank I use if anyone wants to try to steal money from me. Um, and being a .org, plays into some of the things we'll talk later on, so I needed an example that was a dot .org. Uh, here's the PayPal example. You can see that the second A is not an actual A. It looks just like this A, doesn't it? it looks like that A, but it's actually a Cyrillic small letter A at that code point. Well, that's, that. that's um, I think, heck, so it's not really what we want to say, but 430. All right, like the sources of homoglyphs, there's also the character sets out there that are likely to give you some good choices for homoglyphs. Um, the Cyrillic script, which I always showed a bunch of those, all these characters are actually the Cyrillic version of them and have a different byte value than normal Latin characters. Also, Latin itself is actually encoded twice. There's a normal width Latin, no, basic Latin, and there's full width Latin. So all of these characters actually appear as two separate code points in Unicode. And a while back, I was, if you were here for the last talk, I talked about steganography. I was trying to hide data in data. Well, I want to make a command and, commote, command and control channel that used Twitter, but also uses steganography. So what I did was I used the low version of the Latin character and the high version of the Latin character to encode ones and zeros to encode my commands and threw them out there on Twitter. And the bot would grab them and see which version of the character it was and pull its commands from that. That worked pretty good in Firefox. It, it, generally, it looked OK. But all sorts of other third party uh, Twitter readers just totally gobbled it up. So it didn't work nearly as well as I'd liked. 
Uh, there's also slashes that appear in multiple places in Unicode. Like each one of these, this is your standard slash that you're going to use in most URLs. There's a bunch of other slashes also. Most of them we can't actually use because they're on a blacklist. Uh, however, oh, I think I'm missing one here. This particular, I believe, this is a Japanese character. That one we can use. We'll talk a little bit about that later on. <coughs> All right, slashes. Let's say various registrars, you know, got on the whole idea that people could use homoglyphs to be able to fake names. So they have certain um, uh, methods of saying, okay, we won't let you use that character. But if you're the owner domain, you can kind of fake it yourself. For instance, if I use this slash, which isn't the real slash, Microsoft.com, this actually is not at Microsoft.com. That's not a real slash. It's actually at IronGeek.com. Since I control this domain name, I control its DNS, and I can set up a DNS entry that would correspond to this. Now, this attack used to work a lot better, but modern browsers, uh, not so well, which we'll cover here in a second. Now, to do all this research, I wanted to see how browsers would actually represent this um, IDNA. And I was, like I said, I was hoping to have more pwnage in Sue, but um, fortunately, it looks like, well, fortunately for security, unfortunately for my plaything, um, they uh, seem to have largely fixed this to where these attacks aren't as viable as they once were. But to test all this, I wanted to make all these homoglyphs. However, copying and pasting from a character set or going out to like, oh, various websites that had the Unicode charts and copying and pasting was a pain. So I put together this particular script out of JavaScript and PHP that allows you to quickly generate homoglyphs. Now let me show you what we got going on. No idea if it's going to be big enough for you all to see, but let's say uh, I wanted to go have google.com. Oh, I didn't mean to type zeros there. There's google.com. I can drop down and I can change which characters I use. Like, I don't want to use a standard G, I want to use, or a standard O, I want to use this O, which is at a different code point. I can then scroll down, and that's the actual URL it points to. But you see that O doesn't look quite right. If I go looking around, I can probably find an O that's a more perfect match. That's a little bit better. Or I can choose one where I don't have two O's that are right next to each other that look the same. Like, for instance, if I choose both the same, that probably looks a lot better. But if I mouse over it, it may not be the same. Now in this case it is. One of the side effects I found, remember how I mentioned that uh, Latin is in two places in Unicode? The browsers I've tested, if you use the full width Latin version, um, web browsers will automatically uh, canonicalize it back to the low Latin. So it doesn't do you any good. Um, so let me actually choose a different O in this set on both of those. Let's choose, uh, I think that's a zero actually. Let's use you and you. That looks like a fairly good Google, but if you see the bar down bottom left-hand corner, it's different. Let me actually submit this so I get a version of it that I can use. The actual code I would register in my DNS system, the domain I'd register is this one. Now, a distinct problem with that, though, is old browsers would show this as this in some cases. Unfortunately, for various reasons, we don't get that effect now. But I made this tool so you can easily generate homoglyphs. You can type in the straight-up ASCII up here, make a few changes, and uh, there you go. You can get the results below. Oh, another feature I added. This is going to become interesting later on. Let's say I had a notepad.exe. There's a reverse character that basically you can tell uh, a string to, okay, from here on out, reverse the, the uh, character order. Because, well, there's various languages like Hebrew and Arabic where you actually read it from right to left. So sometimes in Unicode, you need to be able to switch things up. So see that notepad.exe? All right, notepad.exe. I'm not choosing any homoglyphs for that, but I am choosing to use the Unicode reverse character. And let's see what we got down here. E-E-X-E, whatever that is. Oh, and that reminds me, uh, before I continue, I probably should uh, open up. Dropbox to one of the location of examples. You see those files? They're all text files, right? Well, except for like the AU3. We'll get back to that in a minute. Um, but that's the homoglyph attack generator. You can basically make those punny codes. You can choose uh, 
different uh, look-alike characters. It just makes things a lot easier in copying and pasting. Uh, here's the problem <coughs> I found later on when I thought I could use this for pwnage. Was uh, web browsers have gotten a lot more smart to this, and uh, they've implemented things to, to keep you from uh, being able to uh, easily use these to spoof domain names. One of the things they do is there's a white list. If you're not in this list of top level domain names, by the way, somewhere in this mess is .org, uh, it will not show you the Unicode version of the name. It won't use the special characters. Instead, it will always show you the punny code, which is pretty obviously not the URL you're trying to go to. Also, if you have uh, this particular value set to true, uh, anybody ever gone into like about colon config in the Firefox to tweak various options? Well, if you go into that, about colon config, you can look at the whitelist and you can also turn this option on and on, on and off, but default it's set to false. If you set to true, you're always going to see the punny code and you won't see the unit code. Uh, however, even if you leave the default false, most of the time you're going to see punny code. Also, if any of these characters in the blacklist and those slashes, most of those slashes appear in this list, appears in a domain name or URL, but otherwise it's valid, I should say in a DNS label, not necessarily in the URL. If any of those characters appear, it automatically shows the penny code to make it let more obvious that the person is not going to the URL they think they are. Um, those other protections that are implemented by, well actually let me go ahead and show you that in Firefox. For instance, uh, I already pasted this one in, and that looks like a Google. I'm not going to answer the phone this time because people keep calling and not actually. I go to Google, no, it doesn't <coughs> automatically put the URL in there. It put the punny code version. That makes it pretty obvious. That's not what you know. I'm trying to spoof people into thinking I'm, they're going to. So do you do the same thing with DNS spoof? Hold on a second. Oh, my, it was actually my boss's boss's boss calling. I'll call him back after the talk. Uh, but uh, nine does it. IE nine does things slightly different. I'm so sorry about this, guys. But these people. Hello, this is Adrian. Someone who's getting here. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. All right. Sprint coverage sucks so bad in this area that that's not even possible. See, some speakers complain about others answering their phone during a talk. I can actually just go ahead and do it. Sometimes, like I said, I get 20 people on the other end. It's fun. So tomorrow, whatever Dave's talking, we all yeah, need to Yeah, we all need to call Dave when he's talking tomorrow. <laughs> IE9 does things a little bit differently. Uh, it bases its decision whether or not to show punny code or not on mismatches between characters. Like, for instance, if you start mixing Cyrillic and Latin, it may freak out and say, okay, I'm going to show punny code just in case. You also may get a warning along these lines that the web address seems to carry, have characters in it that, uh, and symbols that can't be displayed. Uh, let see. Also, if the character's not using any language, it's going to show punny code. And if you use a mixed set of scripts that do not belong together, you may end up getting punny code. Oh, sorry, that's the part I should have said. If you're like mixing Cyrillic with uh, English. This one is, let's say your web browser is set to be US English. Uh, well, if you start putting Cyrillic characters in there, it's going to say, that doesn't seem right. We're going to show you punny code regardless. Chrome is very similar. By the way, these versions are slightly older because I did most of this research like um, two months ago. Uh, whether or not it's going to show punny code is going based on a lot of things. Once again, you have what your language settings are in the browser. Also, intercompatible scripts, and there's a character blacklist that if any of these blacklisted characters show up, it's automatically going to render this punny code. Well, I did a bunch of tests generating different uh, URLs, and I'll show you the results here in a second. Also, besides the defenses that are in the web browser itself, there's also various defenses that are put in place by registrars. For instance, the registrar I normally use, I try to uh, registered this particular version of iucu.org. Once again, I'm not picking on them. I just need a .org because that, that .org is in that whitelist. A .com, I'm never going to be able to, uh, in Firefox, show it as the actual value. It's always going to show as punny code, so I had to use a .org or some other top level domain name that's whitelisted. When I tried to use this one with the weird uh, Cyrillic letter I, uh, it gave me a warning that in .orgs only certain characters were allowed, and certain character sets. So I started looking around for those character sets. I also had the same problem when I tried to register things with that slash in it. Uh, as I recall, uh, you can get around some of this. For instance, that slash, you notice most slashes were blacklisted. This particular, I think it's a Japanese character, looks like a slash, but it's not blacklisted and can be used in some cases. 
So registrars, you know, look for these certain bad characters and may not let you register. My approach to testing all this out was to actually generate a whole bunch of different um, uh, iDNA names and see how different web browsers and also social networks and web apps demonstrate them and how they actually show them to the user. And unfortunately I found, well, I should say unfortunate because I wanted to play, but it seems like people have gotten a lot better at this, especially web browsers. When I tried to um, make all these different URLs, for instance, this is omega.com, using that particular Unicode value, Firefox, or everybody for the com, displayed it as its punny code version. For .org though, well, Firefox went ahead and played along and showed it as omega.org. However, IE and Chrome, still punny code. You'll notice a little trend here. IE and Chrome always show the punny code, no matter what I threw at it. Um, Google.com, I'm going to try to spoof the G in it. It saw as a .com, .com is in the black, or not in the white list, so it automatically showed punny code. Org, though, is in the white list. So this particular I, it showed it, which isn't the real I, it's a, I believe that's a Cyrillic I, it showed it as this. So that looks pretty good. Unfortunately, you couldn't, well, fortunate, I suppose, for security, you couldn't register that. The, the uh, registrar wouldn't allow it. Also, this is a version of Google. I used all full width Latin. You know how it looks a little weird? Well, the, the web browsers I tested normalized it to normal Latin, so it was just like going to the real google.com. Also, when I tried to use the slash, it's blacklisted in Firefox, and I believe in IE9 and all the others. So when I tried to use it, it showed punny code in all... Someone really wants to talk to me. Uh, it shows punny code in all the examples. All right, other oddballs, like I said, that IUCU.org, I wasn't able to register. However, these particular ones, my registrar didn't seem to complain about. I didn't actually go all the way through to register it to make sure, but of all of them, this one would probably be the best option because notice how underline obfuscates the part that's not, that makes it not look like a normal eye. These ones, the registrar didn't say anything about, and also Firefox seemed to want to show them as the Unicode version. So in Firefox, these would actually be good spoofing options. However, in both Chrome and IE, it always showed the punny code. So that going back to the whole thing is this attack isn't nearly as useful as it once was. Also, this particular character, this particular Japanese character, was the only real good substitution I had for a slash on modern browsers. All right, so, so far, <coughs> so far, um, web browsers have been kind of a uh, no-show. Modern web browsers don't show the uh, punny code ver as they don't show the Unicode version. They show the punny code. So, uh, how about web apps? How do they parse the links? So what I did was I constructed these strings and pasted them into things like Twitter and Facebook and whatnot to see how it was going to show it to the user to see whether or not you could make a convincing spoof. Well, one of the things I did was I took Gmail and sent something into. Um, Sorry, went to Gmail and sent something to my campus mail to look at an Outlook. And you can see some things did work. It, it showed here the proper URLs and it accepted the characters. So if you moused over it, you would see the um, punny code version. But notice here, because I used the weird slash, it actually separated it into two different URLs instead of one. Also, you get this pink phishing warning. In case that was too small for people to see, I've actually zoomed into it. Here, oh, also, Cyrillic I. It confused it. If I didn't have the HTTP in front, the parser in uh, Outlook, I'm assuming the Outlook that did this part, wouldn't necessarily see the I as part of the URL. The reason this becomes important is if you're trying to bypass filters and so forth, how something decides where, what part is part of the URL, what part's not, could have some interesting ramifications. I haven't figured out a way of exploiting this yet, but it bears some further research. And like they said, these ones, these URLs, because of that weird slash, it sees those as two URLs as opposed to one URL. Gmail, I had similar results. I went to Outlook and emailed my Gmail account. Uh, and we had similar odds and ends. Now, in this case, once again, we got that split URL effect. Also, it didn't know how to parse that I. And also didn't know how to parse these Gs for whatever reason. So both of these cases, not particularly interesting phishing, not particularly um, realistic phishing scams or convincing phishing scams. Facebook gave me these results. I uh, pasted things in, and uh, here's what got out. In pretty much all cases, it seemed to actually uh, do the URL correct. Now, in the case of the IUCU.org, 
where I didn't have an HTTP in front, it didn't do that. But everything else, it seemed completely happy with and actually linked to it the way I intended it to link to it. So of all these, Facebook is probably the easiest to actually do a convincing spoof on. <laughs> um, he has a little zoom in of that same thing. I wonder how many messages I'm gonna have. I'm, I'm thinking my, my buddies at work are actually um, cranking me in somehow. I'll get to that in a second. Uh, let's see, Twitter. <laughs> Twitter would never do that. Yeah, yeah, not, not him. Uh, Twitter totally gobbles everything. I mean, you, you're going to get the uh, short and punny code version of it, and it's going to be obvious that it's not what you really wanted to go to. Once again, the I caused some problems in iucu.org, but everything else, you see it totally gobbled it up, and it was pretty obvious that it wasn't the URL I was trying to spoof. So, I was a little disappointed. When I went to research, I wanted to see if I could find some good, valid uh, URLs, and I did find some for Firefox, but they only worked for Firefox, not Chrome and IE. So what other ways could I use uh, Unicode to screw around? Well, I started thinking about um, other errors you could use, like um, conicalization errors. And I've yet to find an app that does this necessarily, but let's say someone, uh, let's say someone normalizes. Actually, you know what, they do know what the schedule is, so I guess they could be calling because of that. Uh, that's seriously phasing me. Let's say you um, do your filtering first and then your conicalization afterwards. Well, this particular greater than less than symbol, let's say if you use it in the script tag, isn't the same as this one. If you do your filtering first, it's not going to filter that, but if this is conicalization afterwards, this becomes that and you just bypass the filter. Now, I don't necessarily know of an application that works that way, but that's an idea of using Unicode in such a fashion. Also, name spoofing. I tried to uh, see various web apps if I could become someone else by basically making a name that was similar. I went on to IP boards that um, the people at Hack5 run, and Darren Kitchen had his name out there, but I modified it and changed one of the letters to not be, I think, uh, I think it was the... Uh, Oh, the K and the K. This K and this K looks the same, but it's different. You're not able to use the same name on the forum system as someone else, but you can use a Unicode name and it still looks right. So I became Darren Kitchen for a short time. Now, it was pretty obvious that it wasn't really him because he has six, six billion posts and I had like two, but it's an option. I tried to do the same thing on Twitter. Like, I wanted to become Kevin Mitnick. Why not? Uh, and fortunately, it said <laughs> alphanumerics only, so it wouldn't let me. Then I decided I'd want to become Rick Hayes on Google. Again, similar problem, it wouldn't let me use non-ASCII. Now I did test this out on Windows 7, and Windows 7 allows me to create an uh, account name that has Unicode characters in it. So I had like two different Adrians. Uh, not sure exactly how I'm going to be used that yet, but it's possible. OS 10 didn't let me, and I haven't tested on uh, Linux yet, but if anybody wants to play around with that homoglyph attack generator and copy and paste, it ought to be uh, doable to see. Now, the whole right to left thing, I actually didn't know about this until like um, last week. Josh Kelly, one of my coworkers, said something about, um, oh yeah, we saw this one other person's talk where he used uh, this reverse Unicode character to make EXEs not look like EXEs. So I started playing around with it. Apparently it's out there so that you can have uh, mixed scripts and characters that normally are supposed to be read, read right to left, read left to right along those lines. But the actual representation of the byte order is still what you'd expect. So, for instance, you see this particular URL? That URL ha is reversed, but I'm using that reverse character, so everything is shown backwards, even though it's read by the computer in the correct way. So that's actually Microsoft.com. Hmm. So, <laughs> it looks like it's on Microsoft.com, it's actually Microsoft.com. Is that a call or did I reverse that the other way? Um, Actually, I think that's why I had to paste in, and I tried to spoof Microsoft from iongeek.com by having it reversed on the opposite side. Uh, there's actually details out there on this particular web page, but that's one of the reasons I added that feature in. Now, this is another one of those features that I think lasted for a while, and you could use this on web browsers, and they fixed it. Uh, for instance, if I try to go to this particular URL, Says I could not be found. No. What happens if I try to copy that? 
Yeah. Let's see what happens. I think I used the reverse character in that. Yeah, that didn't quite work the way I wanted it to. Let me go ahead and go out to my punny code generator, because I think I copied and pasted what I didn't intend to in that URL. So let's go out here. Let's reverse this. And now let's go ahead and use the reverse character to spin it around the opposite way. And go down here. Now it says Microsoft.com slash mock Keegan blah, 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 whatever. Let's click on that and see what it tries to go. See, it totally gobbled that particular section. Mind staying at one time, you could actually get away with using that for spoofing URLs, but uh, not so much anymore. However, there are other interesting things you can do. Let's talk about EXEs, BATs, VBSs, and so forth. Let's talk about file names. All these have text in the front, but they're not actually text files. Let's, I think someone got screwed up with my <coughs> Unicode characters. By the way, when you start putting weird Unicode characters in your PowerPoints and you start exporting between Mac and Windows, you get odd effects. Let's actually drop out to here. All right, what kind of file do you see there? What's tab backwards? That file. You are pwned. Uh, xdoc, xcod.txt, that actually opens up as a Word doc. By the way, when I tried to send these through Outlook, I was able, it still displayed them backwards like that. Now, if you try to send a zip file though, <coughs> or it's not a zip file, an exe, it still saw it as an exe, because the computer still read it in the right byte order. But to the human eye, this exe, and oh, notice how I put uh, a different icon there. Actually, let me. View, eh, large icons. Notice how it looks like a little text file icon? That's because I copied the text file icon using a different tool, made an exe out of it that looks like a text file. Uh, Text.text, .text, I have no idea why I created that. That doesn't make much sense. It's a text file. I think that's why I was copying and pasting stuff from. And SBV is a little VV script. So that was kind of fun to play around with. And, but by the way, if you drop out to a command prompt and try to do a directory listing, it just shows that strange reverse character as a question mark. Now, if you want to play around with this stuff, there's some useful sites I found. There's actually a Unicode security, configuration pay, uh, security considerations page that lists a lot of potential problems with Unicode. So when people are implementing a system, what they need to think about. There's also the Unicode converter, which I use for like Oh, I know this one particular character. I want to test its effects. I was able to plug in its hex value and use it. If you want to look up the names of various Unicode characters and where they are in the code point list, file format that info is a good site for that. And then there's my attack generator, which I think this is another victim of uh, the exporting between Windows and uh, OS X. You go to my attack generator and uh, mess around with doing the reversing things, uh, faking domain names or faking usernames. Like I said, this, I want to test with more web apps faking usernames and trying to pretend you're someone you're not. There's this, a whole plethora of uh, web apps you could test that against. And it did seem to work on at least the one form system I tested it on. References, a whole, whole lot. Uh, one of the ones I want to mention here, uh, I should, let's see, uh, Jay Oblins, I actually saw his talk at uh, HackerCon, not HackerCon, uh, sorry, DojoCon 2010. 2009, sorry, 2009, and um, that kind of got me interested. Oh, maybe I'm wrong. It was it 2010 or 2009? I don't even know now. Yeah, it was 2010. He uh, kind of got me interested in the whole punny code thing. There was also a book called um, Oh, The Tangled Web: A Guide to Securing Modern Web Applications. It spelled out a lot of stuff that I thought was really interesting. And uh, there was a guy named uh, Weber. I think it's Chris Weber who did a talk at Black Hat, and he started a paper on Unicode security vulnerabilities, but it never actually finished it. It was like basically a preview copy. And he apparently gave a talk at Black Hat, and some of the subject matters he has bring some interesting ideas for further research on using Unicode to uh, exploit systems. Again, Bibicon, come if you can. And finally, any questions? Yes? Uh, is it possible to use the URL through I suppose you could. 
Um, but even then, even then, when it goes to the actual URL, it's going to look like punny code in most cases. I don't see why I don't see why URL shortener wouldn't accept it. But the URL shortener, you have the shortened version. Then all of a sudden, you have the Unicode version. Then all of a sudden, you have the punny code version showed in the. So it's it's not it's going to be fairly obvious that it's a phishing attack. So in a pen testing engagement, utilizing that along with EtherCat. Possibly, but if you go that far along with using EtherCat, you can put up your own box and pretend to be whatever site they're going to without using the whole domain name spoofing. If you're, if you're redirecting their traffic and you want to make it look like they're going to a corporate webmail, a lot of times when you run set or something like that, duplicating the site, they're coming back to your IP address. Yes, yeah, so if you control DNS, you can point them to your own IP address with the real domain name, right. so you wouldn't have to do the spoofing. Oh, okay. yeah. Like, this is a very esoteric thing that I, I thought would, would work out better as far as, you know, real use. And I still think there's some interesting things we can do with Unicode and uh, spoofing other objects. And then I need to look more at other control characters, like that weird reverse character. There might be other things out there that could have interesting ramifications like that. But uh, a lot of this talk is just to give ideas but not, not a whole lot of directly useful stuff as of yet. But if anybody has any ideas, uh, email me and I'd like to do some more research on it. I do find the thing that Josh showed me about doing the uh, EXEs reversed kind of cool. Like the That's got some any other questions? All right, in that case, I'll shut down my machine and let the next speaker uh, come on up. Actually, you're the last speaker. Huh? Yeah. All Adrian all day. All Adrian all day. <laughs> um, Adrian, we had a speaker. What I, I don't want all Adrian all day. Calls of he could be here. Oh, another one? Um, the second speaker did not show up, so Adrian um, filled in for us. Is that Johnny Long? Um, anyway, thank you very much. We'll Let's be back see. tomorrow at 9 o'clock. We have uh, six hours worth of talks tomorrow. And they all will be here. <laughs> I'm going to leave. Six hours? You can't leave. You've got to talk tomorrow. You might want to finish your talk this morning. Let's go get drunk. Let's go get drunk. I think it's going to be I don't think I have one thing to say. Get some more. Yeah, hack 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 some more. Yeah, no, I was just going to do it. I haven't been there yet. It's false advertising. I'm sure we're going to do it.